Welcome to the webinar on cloud strategy failures and cloud anti-patterns. So my name is uh, Peter van Eyck. I have a CCSK. I've been one of the first guys to have that. CCSP as well, one of the first guys to have that. And I'm probably one of the most experienced cloud trainers worldwide. Partly because of my age, I suppose, and partly because I've delivered more than 50 of the CCSK sessions and a couple of dozen other cloud sessions. I also have a YouTube channel, channel where this uh, recording is going to land up to. It's called Club Cloud Computing. It has a uh, very interesting, I think, and uh, specific uh, presentation on why cloud, but more about that in a second. So what we want to do in this webinar is to to, to take the perspective of organizations that go about in transitioning to cloud, because cloud, in my opinion, is the new IT supply chain model. And the YouTube that I just referred to, why cloud computing is changing your job, is actually explaining the big why of that. So we'll talk about how organizations, mostly consumer, cloud consumers, but also cloud providers, go about in that transition, and how they use and implement cloud. Now, this is the start of a conversation as far as I'm concerned. So type all your comments and questions into the chat box. Uh, help me improve this story and help me find some more fancy pictures. So uh, let's let's dive into this. Let's see if we can keep this uh, sweet and short so we have time for Q&A as well. As I said, the cl cloud is a new IT supply chain model. Um, it is like IT 5.0, if you wish. And it turns IT supply into a complicated interconnected chain of companies that outsource to one another, much in the same way as the car industry works, where the car company only produces 20% of the car, or the iPhone is, is produced, where Apple doesn't even manufacture it. This structure of the industry, I think, is inevitable. It's, it's an historic inevitability uh, for any maturing industry. And now the, it's the uh, IT's turn to, to do this. If you want to know more about the backdrop of this, more about uh, more explanation of this, just tune into that YouTube video that I just referred you to. And maybe you already saw that, and, and in which case you know what I'm talking about. So it's a new model, but it means that there are a lot of things that can go wrong. You know, whenever we start to live in a new world, we inevitably make uh, mistakes. And that, this is true for cloud as well. What I want to present you in the, in the couple, uh, next couple of minutes, or maybe dozens of minutes, is a number of specific patterns on how cloud can fail. Now, this will be text mainly. I don't have any fancy bullet points or pictures to, to show for that. Uh, never mind. Um, think of this in your mind. Maybe you want to type in some suggestions of uh, and, and points that as they come across. So the first big uh, failure pattern is that a company, from a strategic perspective, from a board level perspective, just ignores cloud computing. And this could be on the board level or on the IT management level. Or even worse, they can try to forbid or eliminate all cloud usage in the company. Now, the, the underlying reason for this is that uh, companies don't understand the, the far-reaching implication of this new model and the necessity, actually, of moving to that model. Now, I'm not saying that everybody should move to Amazon or Salesforce, uh, because the cloud model is a little bit more complicated than that, um, which you understand if you watched my other video. But there is a, a need to go there. There is a, a need to develop business, um, and that's called digital infusion, for one. Now, if you ignore or even forbid cloud, what happens is that business units will self-service uh, their software as service applications, will self-service even platform or infrastructure in order to get their, uh, their things done. And they will start developing software themselves outside the realm of the IT department, uh, which is not necessarily bad, but also outside of any control over that or any governance over that. And that will lead to out of control cloud usage where you run more risks than necessary and get fewer benefits than you could have. Now, I'm not saying that you should um, you know, do the reverse of this, um, allow any cloud usage at all, but definitely just ignoring or forbidding a cloud is not the way to go. Any of you guys have that 
uh, experience uh, of companies that try to to uh, sort of ignore or even eliminate cloud computing. And just please please type that as we go along. And that, that the same holds for any of the future, uh, any of the following um, cloud uh, anti patterns. Okay, so one typing, one typing. Okay, we'll wait for that. Uh, I don't want to have any. Okay, I know some of which have tried to eliminate. Then what happens if you try to to do this, uh, Jan? Okay, we see two people typing. They fail. <laughs> they fail to uh, eliminate it. You mean so? And 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 the bad consequence of that beyond uh, failing in this strategy, what makes it worse? I mean, is it is it like lost opportunities? Is it like um, you know, uh, business gets upset? Yep, sure. So you get a lot of noise that that's not going into the right direction. Okay, you lose all control over shadow IT, right? And why is that bad in itself? I mean, you could you could make a case for shadow IT, and I have a anecdote around that that is a little bit more complicated. Uh, maybe that's something for a uh, for another webcast. As a matter of fact, uh, it was something that my father ran into in the 60s. Actually, didn't have anything to do with IT, but with um, the necessity for innovation as it appears at the edge of a company. Okay. Um, I'm going to give Craig a little bit of time to finish the sentence, and then we're going to move on to uh, the next uh, topic for that. Uh, let's see, we have a couple more. You end up with lock in or loss of data or whatever, bad things. So on to the next one, private cloud. Now, a lot of companies, when they think, uh, well, we need a cloud strategy, but let's do it safe. Let's turn all private cloud, let's turn all cloud usage into private cloud. Well, for one thing, so any, any of you have an experience in that? Any 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 uh, situations where you ran into that? And just keep typing as I speak if you have uh, some ideas and, and why this is bad. For one thing, private cloud a private cloud strategy kind of assumes that the only cloud you want to need is infrastructure as a service. Um, but there's also software as a service. Which you well, which doesn't really you know make much sense in a private cloud uh, world, I suppose, beyond what you already have. But you knew what the problems were with that. Now, the the, the biggest problem to begin with is when companies uh, set up a private cloud, but don't adapt any provisioning processes around that. So what they do is instead of uh, physical machines, you are offering virtual machines. But you're not changing any of the governance and provisioning processes around that. So whenever you want to get a virtual machine, it goes through the same lengthy procurement or uh, approval cycle that a physical machine had, ending you know, where you're shaving one week off of a six-week procurement cycle. Now, that's not going to give you the benefits that cloud is supposed to bring you. And what's worse is that if you don't put in the uh, governance, you will run into um, you know, a lot of resource contention issues that are not resolved. Um, you have uh, you may have you may get some security issues because you're you're applying a security policy in a blanket way. And I'll get back to some of this in a, a little later. And um, and you, you're not necessarily developing the features that your customers want, your internal customers want for their uh, their service for 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 what they need to do it. In, in short, if you try to compete with, with Amazon and Microsoft, you're basically going to fail achieving that objective. So you will be worse off in your service uh, uh, while at the same time being more expensive. So you're sinking, uh, sinking um, you have a lot of sunk costs in that uh, stuff and it will not be used because it will be too expensive or it will not be usable or both. Now, as a sort of you know nuance here, there may be a a use case for managed private cloud in under certain circumstances uh, for certain applications but by and large uh, basing your full IT strategy or your full yeah you know, your full IT strategy on private cloud is a another recipe for failure so does this sound familiar uh, guys have you seen any of this Is it as bad as I, I, I depicted the picture, depicted the story? So waiting for one uh, one type. 
on browsing typing. We had a so you had a private cloud. Okay, had as in past uh, tense. Uh, 1600 VMs. Well, that's significant. So what made you stop doing that? Or what happened? No, that's the of course, the interesting things. We, okay, the testing. Yeah. Okay. Is it still being used? And and if it's still being, what was the disadvantage of of that strategy? Now, correct me. Uh, you know, definitely. If if you uh, uh, if you have a seriously large private cloud, and I think 1600 VMs is a small private cloud, then you may, in, in certain circumstances, have the business benefit there. But uh, quick, uh, let me know what happened to it, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll I'll keep moving along to keep this recording uh, a bit uh, interesting. So. Uh, if you don't do uh, okay, developing the automation was expensive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, your private cloud doesn't come cheap. I mean, and if you want to do as Amazon does, then it's going to cost you the same amount of uh, effort, which is a lot. Anyway, uh, another uh, strategy that you can have is centralized cloud management by an IT department. We see various uh, you know sides to this, and the situation that I have in mind is well, there can be a couple of situations here. Uh, what I've seen one of my customers do was, okay, the IT department gets the bill for all cloud usage, and then uh, the other departments try to use it, or will actually use it. Now, uh, the problem is that a central IT department uh, not cannot uh, easily deal with variable costs. You know, your, op your standard IT department has a yearly budget, and you know, it, that doesn't work with cloud. Either you spend much more or much less than, than what you budgeted. And in either case, that the, the IT department then becomes a profit center, which it typically isn't, and it, you know, it, it isn't governed like a, um, a profit center. So what happens is that you, know, you don't have any cost control in that because you don't have any uh, leverage over the users. You don't have any planning, and and even though you know centralized cloud management can give you some illusion of control, uh, you don't have control. And um, if you if you don't do it right, then this centralized cloud management will actually um, negate any provisioning uh, speed up that 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 the cloud might give you. You're adding an an, an additional layer of control, and if you don't do that uh, properly, if you don't um, uh, make that layer of control have additional value, uh, allowing speed up in processes, then that control will, will be considered as damage and everybody will route around it, as the old I I internet saying goes. So, uh, you know, there's, there's generally speaking, uh, this doesn't really uh, work well. And, you know, uh, and we're talking about infrastructure here mostly, but for software as a service, the same uh, stuff holds. And in a different way, also, because the departments, I mean, it's an, IT departments were never very good in figuring out what the best application was for a very specific uh, business user. Now, obviously, to, to, to nuance this a bit, some centralized facilitation of cloud can be good. And what we see, what we see coming up, although I haven't seen um, a lot of great usage of it, is uh, the so-called cloud management platforms. And what you can do with a, with a cloud management platform is, is basically budget uh, public cloud uh, usage, pu budget public infrastructure as a service usage. And that does have its benefits because if you if you budget it and, you, and if you limit it from a, let's say, control perspective, you can actually allow, uh, let's say, pre-approved templates to be spun up in, in a public cloud under certain security and governance um, requirements. And that will actually speed up the process that you would otherwise have to follow. So there is a potential here, but you know it, it's few and far between. Any of this sound familiar? Um, while I, I go on with the next one. So uh, if we're doing, don't doing, you know, uh, private, don't doing cloud ignore, don't doing centralized cloud management. What do we do? Well, what a lot of companies have decided to do is all in on cloud. You know where where we we've seen people on uh, you know big companies you know with the, the size serious banks um, and even more having a public 
publicly stated policy of moving everything to the cloud and, 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 and uh, killing all data centers in a couple of years. Um, I go like, hey, you know, I, I think cloud is the next, the next best thing to slice bread, but uh, this may be jumping a little bit to conclusions. And uh, what I want to bring into here is the, the word, the, the notion of cargo cult. Anybody ever heard of cargo cult? Well, cargo cult is a kind of uh, religion in, in a way that says like, if we just do the same moves that everybody else is doing, we're going to get the same results as everybody is, is getting even if we don't understand what we're doing. Uh, go look it up on Wikipedia. So the whole notion that, you know, as, as if some company is moving all in on cloud, that does not necessarily mean that it's a good idea for you. Because the, the number one thing that, that it's lacking is any understanding of the business case as to why you would move a specific uh, workload to cloud. And if you don't have a specific business case, um, you're going to end up in, uh, with more expense. Um, another thing is if you move all in on cloud without the proper governance, you're going to get, going to end up in with uh, uncontrolled cloud spend. And you know, documented cases are there where developers without any cost awareness would basically spin up a couple of machines, you know, uh, and leave them running overnight, which is, you know, one of the most obvious things that you, you shouldn't be doing on, on machines like that. Beyond that, um, it probably lacks any any um, um, or one of the risks that you have would have in in a strategy like this is that you are will still be trying to to take all your in-company security policies the, your existing security policies with manual provisioning of infrastructure as a service with uh, whatever password policies that work in a company environment but not in a public environment and so on and so forth. There's a lot of risk associated with uh, moving um, forward too boldly. However, a cloud first strategy does make sense. You know, um, whenever you have a new workload uh, or a workload that needs to be significantly re-engineered, it does make sense to have a good look at does cloud bring us any benefits and how do we um, create that benefit? How do we ensure that benefit? So let's move to the next one. Um, and if you're familiar with this, just uh, type uh, yes, all in, uh, and this is the way it fails. The final one I want to discuss with you in this uh, webinar is the so-called lift and shift. Now, lift and shift basically, depending on the specific variation that you have, is okay, we take our existing stuff and lock, stock, and barrel will move it to a cloud provider, probably a uh, public cloud provider. You take your existing software, you take your existing application, and, and you basically run it in on a, on a, on a spinning up on a cloud server. Well, you know, the bad news here is that moving existing kit uh, typically is a very bad business case for a number of reasons. So one of the ways to understand this is that your existing kit uh, has a sunk cost that you basically, you know, write off. Another is that your existing application has had a lot of investment in migrating to it. And in fact, in the total lifecycle cost of a lot of applications, migrating to it is the biggest cost. And now, of course, there are alternatives, you know, but we'll, we'll get to that. The, the other thing is that that, that business case, um, you know, as I said, the migration costs typically dwarf any potential benefits. So, what else is there? Well, from this perspective of the, let's say, technical architecture, and let's move this from the top, from the, from the bottom up, from the perspective of the technical architecture, your cloud servers have different uptime characteristics and different round trip delays between servers. So it often happens that this is going to create in um, a application that is not performing very well. If you just, you know, without any form of refactoring at all, bring it to, to cloud. Another thing is that you're moving your applications in, in silos. You still have the silos, the lack of integration between silos, and that problem is not going to get better. As a matter of fact, it's going to get worse until everything is in the cloud, and even then, it doesn't you know, it disappear as, as by magic. Then, moving up from there, you know, if your current application sucks because the, the data in it is garbage, just moving that garbage to the cloud 
will basically mean that you have garbage in the cloud and you'll be paying for it on a monthly basis unless you clean it up. And an example that you might have is like you have a CRM system, customer relationship management system that has a ton that's very polluted with, with old and stale data. Moving that to the cloud was not, not going to fix those application management issues. So, uh, and then, you know, if you just do it lock, stock and barrel, you're not re-engineering your development practices. You're not using something or not moving towards DevOps or something like that. You are not going to get feature velocity. It's going to be the same rigid IT you always had, but with more moving parts and therefore with more risks. So bad consequence, more risk, uh, few cost savings, if any, potentially negative cost savings and none of the business benefits of cloud. Now, again, nuancing this a bit, you know, if you have uh, old stuff internally that is kind of uh, end of life in a way, then uh, replacing that rather than uh, lifting and shifting it, replacing that old stuff with new software as a service can be worthwhile. The, uh, the, the biggest, you know, the largest volume of business cases we see here in, in this particular space is people getting rid of uh, Microsoft Exchange and moving to uh, Office 365. Now, Microsoft, Microsoft Exchange, you know, what happens is that licenses expire. Uh, people need to move with beyond the 100 megabyte mailboxes. Now, unfortunately, I mean, the reason why this move is so popular basically is because Microsoft Exchange is so much end of life. It doesn't scale very well in and of itself. So um, when you go like, hey, let's reinvest into an entirely new exchange cluster on which our entire business depends, let's hope we can get it work or just move to Office 365, which has uh, a pretty decent uptime and a ton of impressive uh, controls. You know, even banks are moving to 365. And I, I know the people, um, I, I've spoken to people who are running those projects uh, for a number of reasons. That's a different story. So uh, summarizing the lift and shift thing, and if you just move your existing uh, problems to the cloud, you're going to get problems in the cloud. Uh, it, unless you have a seriously challenged data center or other reason of, of really, really, really getting rid of it, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's my advice here. And so in, in a metaphorical way, if you, if you lift and shift your current development practices to the cloud and you don't adapt them, then you're not going to get the benefits that you need. If you still have your manual security processes, your manual change processes, your manual provisioning processes, it's not going to give you the benefits that you want. It may give you some benefits, but it's not going to give you all the benefits that you could be getting. So does this make sense before I move to uh, what we could be doing? Any of these familiar? I think you had that. Any, f any big ones that I missed in this... Uh, five cloud failures really looking forward to your uh, response okay great typing sounds good so we had some uh, earlier comments on uh, internal and on shadow it on uh, private cloud did i miss any of the others so any of the other guys experiences that uh, may or may not have been familiar uh, in, in, in relation to the uh, stuff I've been presenting. Let's have it. Looking forward to it. Okay, six on the service to cloud to save CapEx for aging hardware. Okay, but you know, CapEx, um, this is a, an accounting thing because, um, you know, CapEx is just a, you know, a, how do you call it? An accounting uh, fiction. I mean, you've already paid for the stuff. Were you able to, I mean, were they totally written off and, and were you up for a hardware refresh or was it more like uh, you could you could sell, it, sell them off at, at book value? I know that's a generic uh, question around that. So, and you know, there are two cases here. Either these servers were end of life anyway, so you had to replace them, in which case you're not exactly lifting and shifting them, but you're kind of moving uh, an existing architecture um, to, uh, to, to, to cloud and, and doing the hardware refresh over there. There's a lot of sense in that because you would have to spend that um, migration cost anyway. So why don't you just move to the cloud? I'm, I'm very curious, Greg, as to what your specific situation was there. 
And um, you know, as I said, if, if you go to cloud to avoid investment, uh, that makes sense. If you go to cloud because you just want to get rid of your data center, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. okay. So, and then the point is that, as, as, as my saying goes, um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but it was breaking down. And then definitely there is a good story here. So uh, yeah, just finish your sentence and let's move let's move the question to the higher level. Any any big cloud failures that you are aware of that that I missed out? Probably the biggest one is uh, failure to uh, yeah yeah you, know, you, you can create stuff in the cloud much better than than stuff that you can do in, in inside of your uh, company. And that's because there's a lot of more brain power that you can tap into. And if you want to know more about those arguments, go to my other. YouTube video, the one that I already mentioned. Then I think the biggest one that I, 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 I didn't cover very well is lack of governance of your cloud deployments. And uh, let's maybe put this up for a next version. Lack of cloud governance. But how should that look like? It doesn't work by centralizing this. It works by uh, making sure that everybody in the company understands this. And generally speaking, um, how do we avoid um, a cloud failure? Well, here uh, is a kind of like a process that we see, you know, emerging from a lot of the, um, you know, uh, a lot of the cloud projects that have been uh, have been uh, post mortemed, and I've based this brief summary on a couple of documents that I will and and, and, and a ton of experience that I have had myself. And the documents will be at the end of this presentation. Um, but first of all, you know, the biggest question for, for cloud adoption is to understand the big why. Why do you want to move this specific workload to cloud? Is there a business case? And you know, in one of my courses, I, I run through four different business cases, one of which basically isn't a good business case, and the other ones uh, are, but they're all different. And there's no one specific um, a business case. Well, I give you this business case for replacing stuff, and this is the one that Greg was talking about. But really, it's about a avoiding um, or reducing IT cost model. And there are a ton of other business cases that actually um, are about uh, reasons that pe actual people and actual companies uh, take to go to cloud. So finding the business case is the number one thing you want to do. And sometimes the business case really trumps your business case about you know, moving your kid to the cloud. Next thing up is, is mobilize the, the relevant stakeholders um, that should help you in realizing the business case. And that may involve, for example, legal and compliance and, and procurement. And they may need to adapt some of their thinking and some of their approaches. Now, no, you know, moving to three, no, you know, where no application, no company um, lives in an island. So well, you want to take stock of what your current what your current data and assets are. And you know, data is actually a little bit more important than the, the, the other assets that you have because the data is you know pretty specific to your company and the software typically um, is not. Now you may have some additional and some some um, some existing uh, interfaces and stuff and that's all part of this phase. The other reason why you want to do this phase is that uh, this will really tell you your compliance requirements. Uh, you, you're typically the compliance compliance requirements are derived from uh, what your data is and, and where it is. Based on that, you can actually move to to phase four um, to a cloud architecture future state. And the first answer that you want to get to is on which service model are we basing this? Are we you know selecting uh, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service. I do have an opinion on how you should select that. Um, it is based on your on the competitive necess necessity or not, as the case may be, of your software um, uh, software development. Now, once you get that, and then a lot of other stuff, implementation stuff falls uh, from that. Obviously, you need to do proper governance or embed it into your governance structure. Uh, embedded into any risk management practices that you have. You have to do additional risk management on that uh, workload migration or that workload uh, cloud adoption. And that is really dependent on, on a ton of things. That is a little bit too much detail to, pro to, to discuss here. 
Then finally, uh, you know, ongoing management and monitoring of, of, of the cloud on multiple layers and levels is necessary. And this is where stuff like you know, um, the, the cloud controls metrics um, comes in handy. Obviously, you, you need to get that done early in, in the where you cloud um, the procurement, but you also need to do that um, in, on a continuous basis, more or less. So that is the like like the big elements of uh, a cloud of a successful cloud adoption process. And, and as you can see, this sort of negates the the five fail scenarios that I I, I just mentioned. Now th this is the level of governance that you. Um, that you want to do from the top down. You want to instill in your organization some kind of understanding of these steps. Now, you have to adapt this process to your specific to your specific um, organization. I'm not saying that you should do it in exactly these six steps in exactly these uh, sequence, but you would have to have a very strong case to actually deviate from that. You're most likely to detail out some of these cases and in uh, with a little bit more rigor. So this is what you need to be doing top down. Uh, you, you may or may not do stuff in a private cloud, but private cloud is not necessarily a solution. It's more like, uh, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it can be a problem. It's not necessarily an asset. It can be more a liability or, or a boat anchor if you're unlucky. And the same holds for some of the other um, and the failure scenarios. Now, uh, any, any you know, comments or questions around this? Uh, that's what I would love to know. You know, is 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 this part of the journey that you guys are on? Is that that you and your team is on? What would it mean to you if you could, you know, speed up the proper cloud adoption process? What would it mean to your company? And let's have some feedback on that. We have a couple of people on the call here, and for the benefit of the people listening to the recording, um, I I would really I'd like to have a bit of input from. From you are you on this cloud adoption journey yes or no and that's a very brief answer to type in uh, guys no uh, a couple of you already did ccsk so mm, you've had you've seen some cloud so please keep typing and get me some more that this is why i love having a microphone you know that's um, um on um uh, on the side of the participants and that I don't have to do the waiting on the typing. <laughs> you consult with companies on this journey, right? So, okay, that's really mo moving the question somewhere else. So <laughs> what, what would it mean to those companies if they could have this process in a little with a little bit more um, efficiency, so to say, with a, well, with a bit more, um, uh, you know, speed or, or agility, so almost. Okay, Jan, there are still huge problems with user provisioning. Um, are you talking about user provisioning or other resource provisioning and provisioning to users? And um, and if you have those problems, what would be the root cause of those problems? And I'm, 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 I'm guessing, I'm, I might be guessing here, but I'd love to have your input on this. And we'll see, I really uh, would fancy some answer to that uh, from your perspective as well. Uh, for companies using AWS, understanding the billing is complex. Yeah, and an interesting question, Greg. And who should be understanding the understanding the billing? Whose job would it be to understand the the bill of a specific application architecture or a specific application? Does that matter? I, oops, almost gave away the answer. Okay, so user management, both internal and external. So that's Jan. That's related to federated identity management, I guess. That's something that was part of CCSK. Um, is that is that so? And if, if so, uh, where do you see uh, people struggling? Now keep it keep it coming, and this is an interesting conversation. Now and uh, yeah, I'm flipping back and forth. Okay, that too. There's no dual control for root account. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, and that's the easy bit. You know, you know how to do that, right? And and well, why is it not happening? Is it lack of awareness at the at the proper policy level? Sounds like it. Or is it something that AWS is not providing to you? It's not possible. Okay, yeah, but there are a couple of pretty decent workarounds uh, on that, uh, Jan. Uh, one of them being, well, let's let that's that's too detailed for for right now. 
Well, workarounds. I mean, if you, if you, uh, if you, well, you would have to specify the scenario of what you exactly want, and then figure out what the, the real um, risk is that you're trying to address with that. And you know, any any workaround, any compensating control, you know, you only have to judge it. Is it good enough? You, you don't really want to know if it's perfect or if it looks exactly the same as what you had old school. So uh, interesting things. You know, there's a there's a lot of you know, it ranges from from um, pretty fundamental governance issues down to potentially uh, nitty gritty stuff. Um, yep, um, good and interesting. Um, I have some. I have an opinion on, on all of these, and I'd love to discuss them with you in more detail. So you know, think about what would what would uh, what would be best for for helping you. Any any specific ideas? What would help you best? You know, what kind of you know, uh, a blueprint or what kind of, um, what I say, um, elaboration or specification of some of stuff that, uh, or a standard approach or any, any ideas that you have, because there probably is something for that uh, already. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to the, to the final, final step. And that is some of the things that you could be doing uh, to address these issues. You know, we have had five uh, cloud failure scenarios. I give you six bullets for how you could be um, changing all that. Now it turns out that there's a um, high level. These should be fairly straightforward, but the nitty gritty is a little bit more complex. Point is that if you do understand the overall process, and your senior management understands the overall process, then allocating the resources to get these nitty gritty things um, you know, addressed at the right uh, place in the organization is going to be a lot easier. Okay, so what you could be doing after this uh, training is to, um, although some of you have done some of this already, is there is a certificate of cloud security knowledge training I also have cloud and security architecture included in that uh, learning material. And uh, to the extent that you have been through my training, you have access to that uh, for the time being. I'm planning to move that into a subscription model. <clears throat> if you haven't done CCSK so far, you may uh, consider moving for having a look at my, um, at my understanding CCSK training, which is on, if you search for teachable, um, understanding CCSK, you're probably going to find it. And otherwise you want to look at my website and, and drill down into that. I think it's on the calendar page, the link to it. There's also a cloud adoption essentials e-learning on the same, um, on the same platform, on the same teachable platform that gives you a high level run through of these steps. Then I'm, uh, I was last week, I, I presented, I was, I was, uh, I piloted my practical cloud controls workshop, uh, which is like a half day to, to a full day. Actually, there was a half day at an ISC square meeting, uh, three hours straight. It was uh, three hours straight. You know, and, and if you want to take it a little easier, it's going to be three and a half, four hours, or maybe even a full day. That gives your management or your team the, uh, not even, the, not just a big perspective, but it also gives you through the practical work a good understanding of where you want your cloud stuff to to uh, to go to now if you want to do a little bit uh, more rigorous and repeatable and and bare process you know instill that into the entire company i suggest that you have a look at a couple of uh, resources here one is the uh, cloud security alliance's repeatable cloud deployment process although it's actually uh, i think the, the name is slightly different but um, you probably will find it if you search for that Another one that has come up recently is the uh, Amazon Web Services Cloud Adoption Framework, which also more or less outlines, no, no, it, no, it doesn't outline, it gives you more detail on the, um, on the steps towards cloud adoption. It lists you know, across the organization what you would need to do and when you would, well, kind of what you want to do it. Uh, it looks Pretty interesting. I've I've read through it in uh, in significant detail. There's a there's a, a lot of things in there. I'm not so sure if it also maps to to software as a service, uh, because it is obviously produced by Amazon. But hey, it uh, it's going to uh, it's at least worth a look. And if you want to not just you know basically read through these things, but you know get into the nitty gritty of of 
getting your team towards the next level of competence and not just talking about it, but actually exercising and, and, and doing stuff and working together. Um, I am um, uh, working on a full cloud adoption competence program. Uh, I haven't decided upon the name yet. So any, any, you know, any, any, if you feel that, that this is the level of investment that you need to do in your team, then, then come talk to me because it, it is, uh, um, and there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there that you, that you can use to really accelerate what you're going to, um, uh, the benefits that you're going to achieve or that your clients, uh, in Craig's case are going to achieve. Um, that will be like a three to six month program with a lot of basically homework. Now to end this presentation, to end this talk, I would um, suggest that you go to uh, www.cloudcomputing.com and sign up to my newsletter. Well, people on the call probably already did that. And this will announce, uh, this will help you get early um, early notice of all future events. I'm currently, I'm pretty booked uh, for the next couple of weeks with a number of in-company training sessions. And uh, I'm going to run the a practical cloud controls workshop a number of times um, in the next uh, eight weeks and even beyond that. So um, I'm, I'm, it's going to take a little while before I, I move to the full program um, to announce that, so to say. But if you're interested, I can get you into a pilot of this. And one of the pilots that I'm actually doing for smaller companies, and this is the discussion I'm in right now, is to like small, like like startups, right? That basically may not even have revenue, but they do have to talk to like potential customers that are interested in how they will be um, organizing their their IT security, IT risk management, and I'm working with them to to get a, a lean and mean IT risk management written down in a simple policy document. And that kind of is like the miniature version of the uh, adoption competence program. Now, if you're interested in any, 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 of, in any of these things, just let me know, drop me a line, and I'll close the recording and then we'll have some Q&A afterwards. Um, so if you've been watching this on YouTube, um, you know, hop on over to my website to sign up for my newsletter. Um, like this video, uh, like the other video, share it with people that you know, post it on Twitter or whatever. Of course, only if you like it, because if you don't like it, just tell me what you see or what you find missing. So if you like it, tell somebody else. If you don't like it, tell me. That's the, 